Thank you everyone for joining. Um, my name is Gerald Gregory, Manager of Performance Management, and uh, today we're going to take a look at some of the habits of high-performing fixed ops departments. And I have to tell you, I had a tremendous experience in working through uh, coming up with the content. Uh, so I hope you get as much out of it as I've gotten uh, through the lessons that I've learned through my journey and uh, seeking out those habits of those high-performing fixed ops departments. So today, uh, our agenda, we're going to take a look at a few key areas uh, of your business that are going to help you thrive and be a high-performing fixed ops department. We're going to look at that culture. Culture is very important and oftentimes something overlooked in the dealership experience, especially in our fixed ops department. Then we're going to take a moment and we're going to discuss our customers to get a better understanding of our customer uh, and how we can make their experience a more pleasurable and enjoyable experience in our fixed ops department. Then we're going to visit uh, people. You know, that's a hot topic right now. Finding great help and retaining those people uh, is definitely a cornerstone in uh, having a great fixed ops team. So we're going to spend some time talking through people. Uh, and then we're going to round things out, uh, of course, you know, being at time, we're going to round things out with technology uh, and how to fully embrace that. So we'll start with culture, and, and I'll tell you a story uh, about culture. When, when I first started working in the dealership, uh, it was a trial by fire experience, right? It, I walked in, I got the job, here you go, off to the races, and, you know, learn as you go. That, that typically is the experience uh, of the past, right? Now, uh, things have definitely changed and, and gotten a lot better, but even as we've evolved our training, uh, when we onboard new hires, um, it's an area that we oftentimes still overlook. It's taking the time to really share what the culture is of not only our department, but also of the dealership. So we're going to spend some time really unpacking culture in its essence and how important and vital it is to have that strong culture because it will make a world of a difference in the day-to-day -day interactions for your staff and your customers. So when we think about culture, not only through my experiences, like I said, but also through working with dealers, the first component of a strong corporate culture is going to be the vision. You know, what is your vision and where do we go with it? Next, we've got our values. And so values are going to be a part of that vision. Then we have our place, which is your building. You know, we're going to spend some time unpacking the culture of the physical brick and mortar dealership. Then we're going to take a look at our people, of course, again. And then how do we put that into practice? So we're gonna unpack that over the next 40 minutes or so. Um, and, and hopefully you get something out of this because I, I really did. It, it's a really great experience. So when you think about vision, vision in an essence is the reason why many of our businesses in general, when we think of business, the vision is the reason for the business in most cases. So when you are looking for the vision of your dealership, I want you to ask yourself, do you have one? Does your staff know it? And do you see it in action? You know, the vision for everything that we do at our dealership should be rooted in that mission of what we want to be known for. And the most successful dealers that I've had the opportunity to work with uh, over the last few years all speak to their vision, their mission, their staff believes in it, they believe in it, and in, in, in turn, it, it carries through to their client experience. So a vision is definitely going to be pivotal 
and really shaping the foundation of your fixed ops department. And as simple as it sounds, we oftentimes overlook the importance of that. So I stress the importance to every one of you to take some time and revisit that vision if you have it. And if you don't, take the time to put one together. Work with the rest of the leaders in the dealership, your dealer principals, and figure out what is it that we want our fixed ops team to be known for. Next, you've got values. Well, with values, values are essentially the guidelines on behaviors and the mindsets needed to achieve that vision or mission. So through my experience, what I found uh, during the research for this presentation and also what I you know, experienced myself, these are some key things for us to be able to make sure that are a part of our values to have a high functioning fixed ops team. One is we have to be committed to the customer because without the customer, we have nothing. So we have to make sure that the very first value that is a cornerstone to our mission and vision is a commitment to providing a world-class experience to every customer that walks through our door or that, let's face it, that we go to at this point in day and time. And so the next one is going to be a commitment to continuous learning. We have to instill that behavior and commitment to it throughout our dealership, down to the lot attendants and the lot porters. We have to want to grow those individuals at every level to be able to evolve with the time. You know, technology doesn't wait for us, so we have to keep up with it. It's going to continue going. And that commitment to continuous learning has to extend past that of just doing the OEM training certification to maintain our certification status. We have to stay committed to learning and embracing new forms of technology. That is a cornerstone value that makes our most successful fixed stop team successful, is that they're willing to take on the challenge of continuing to push to learn more and more every day. Next is teamwork. A perfect example of this would be our parts and service department. That's a relationship that requires each other to work together. And oftentimes it can be a struggle. It can be a push and pull relationship where we're going after two different things. But once we realize the importance of working together as a team between those two departments within fixed ops. The sky's the limit. Our most successful fixed ops teams have a great working relationship between parts and service. So when it comes to parts and service, we have to realize that the number one customer in most cases of a parts department is their service department. Once we overcome that objection, and you know, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, I, I've got a dealer in the Northeast where that was a struggle. The, the service department was fully ready to embrace the use of technology, ready to, to make that leap to, you know, providing the customers with what they were asking for, but the parts department wasn't necessarily ready for that experience. So what we had to do was we had to highlight together through the course of some, some quick meetings, the importance of taking care of your number one customer. And in that situation, the parts manager had never thought about it that way. He always looked at, his, looked at his wholesale accounts as his primary customers, not realizing that he had to prioritize the service department because they, at the end of the day, were his best clients. Those technicians come into the windows, those advisors requesting items, the people within the very building they were, were their best customers. And it required us to have a conversation around improving the teamwork amongst them to be able to drive them to work together in turn, making every other aspect of the experience for both the employees and the customer a better one because they were working together now. And then there's honesty. So when we think of honesty, honesty has to be a cornerstone because the customers tell us time and time again that they don't necessarily trust us. So having a value in place for our entire team to be honest 
and truthful with everything that we do will definitely make a huge difference in the customer experience. And the proof is in the pudding. Those high performing fixed ops departments, they focus on honesty, trust, and transparency with every customer interaction because that is what keeps those customers coming back. And then last but not least, we have to be committed to quality. And oftentimes when we think of quality, we simply think of fixing cars right the first time. But quality goes far beyond just fixing the vehicle the right way or the, the, the right way the first time. So quality extends into the experience that your customer receives from the moment they start to do their research to service their vehicles. We have to commit to having a quality website all the way through a quality checkout and delivery process. Every step of that process has to be taken with pride and in turn, the customers will reward you with repeat business. Those highly functioning fixed ops departments understand that quality is the difference between a customer deciding to go to the next dealership because that's the difference that they're gonna receive in their experience. So when we think about place, we're talking about your facilities and the way that your service department not only is laid out, the cleanliness of it, but also what it looks like from the eyes of your customer. So I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, I recently went in for service on my personal truck and I pulled into the dealership, pulled into the service lane and no one was there to greet me. I had never been to this dealership before because I get joy out of you know, having that experience of what a true customer gets when they have their vehicle serviced. So I hop out of the vehicle, a salesman walks by, he's in his phone, he doesn't lift his head to acknowledge that I'm even there. Then a lot attendant, I see he's sprinting across the lot to, you know, he comes through the service bay area, cutting across, off to run an errand, doesn't acknowledge me. So I then walk into the doors because the service desks are not on the lane. Um, there's the open lane and then there's a door where the service advisor's desk are behind the glass. So I walk in, I walk in and there's a gentleman helping another customer to my left. He doesn't acknowledge me. Granted, hey, he's with a customer, right? That customer in front of you is always the most important. But then there's another advisor. She's behind her computer screen. She doesn't lift her head to acknowledge the fact that I'm even standing there. So I put that to the likes of me walking into your home. When I walk into your home, I, I, I would feel a little uncomfortable if no one was there to greet me. I would feel uncomfortable if I was asked to just walk through and you know look for the first person that's going to acknowledge me to offer some form of assistance. And in my experience working with some of those most efficient and highly functioning fixed ops teams, it doesn't always have to be a greeter that's greeting you. But it just has to be a welcoming environment. You know, when I pull in, is there a ton of yelling back and forth? Or is there a sense of calm? Is there a sense of organization? Is there a sense of, uh, you know, I know where to go? That's another aspect. If I pull into the service lane and, you know, your service lane isn't set up with the advisors right there in the lane or, or a um, greeter that's that's present to, to be able to welcome that customer, then I challenge you to look at what is your process? What do you have in place to set the tone for the experience? It is very important that the minute someone shows up, we greet them. The sales team does this very well in most cases. If a customer pulls them to one of those parking spots at the front of the door, someone will be out to greet them within a matter of seconds. Why do we not have that same expectation set in our service department? Because they understand on the sales floor that the greeting makes a world of a difference in being able to take a customer that may be just browsing to actually buying. So when we talk about place, it's very important for us to offer our customers a warm, welcoming environment. 
when we pull in, is there clear direction as to what the next steps should be? Is there someone there that can greet me? Not necessarily even have to check me in, but say, hi, thank you for coming in today. If we don't have someone stationed as a greeter in the service lane, which is completely understandable with staffing challenges, do we have a culture in place to acknowledge the customer within a certain amount of time? It's very important to set the tone when it comes to that welcoming atmosphere for a new customer and a repeat customer. The greeting sets the tone for the entire experience. In many situations, we have the ability to de-escalate a very tense situation for some because their vehicle is broken with a warm, welcoming greeting. Not only do we have to ensure that the customers are greeted, we want to also make sure that we have adequate parking. And I know that might not be a challenge right now uh, with some of the inventory challenges that we're facing across the industry, but oftentimes, uh, when you pull in for service um, or to the dealership for that matter, uh, there is very little parking. Uh, there might be a, an arrow that's pointing this way for you to take your car. I've been to dealers where, you know, they're under construction and we're working to, through those, you know, construction challenges and there's no parking. Or maybe you're in a heavily, you know, dense metropolitan area where, you know, parking is a challenge just based off of the, the current infrastructure of the city uh, and where the dealership is located at. Uh, but something that simple can deter a customer. Uh, and those highly functioning fixed stop teams have definitely looked at removing as many barriers as possible. Uh, and parking tends to be one of those challenges, especially in areas where customers are used to being able to drive in to, to visit you. That is a cultural shift that we're in the midst of right now. So we don't have as much of that, but that's definitely still something for you to look at. So, you know, what I challenge every one of you to do, uh, especially for those GMs, those dealer principals, um, is to just go stand in your service lane at 730 in the morning and watch what that customer interaction looks like. And ask yourself, is this what we want to be known for is this type of experience that we want to provide to our customers. Um, and there's probably a great deal of things that we're doing right, but there's always going to be room for improvement to improve that customer experience. So, so that's my challenge to you when it comes to thinking about place and the culture of your fixed ops team and your overall dealership, that place aspect of the welcome is so vitally important to the overall experience. And then last but not least, we can't forget about the amenities for our customers that do decide to wait. That makes a world of a difference to a customer. Uh, there's no worse feeling than going in for service and feeling like you're sitting at the DMV waiting for your ticket number to be called. Let's face it, that's what most customers feel like when you're having your vehicle service. It's never fast enough. And that's just our, our, our natural knack for that I, immediate I need it now, uh, I need it now, it's, you know. So that's where making sure that we've got great furniture in our waiting rooms, that we've got the coffee, we've got the donuts. I'll tell you a quick story about the waiting room experience. When I was working at the Nissan dealership as a service manager, uh, we had one morning where Krispy Kremes forgot to deliver the donuts and that was the number one frustration of the entire day was our customer base being frustrated over the fact that we didn't have fresh donuts to give them. But that was a part of the culture of that particular dealership. Every morning we would put three dozen donuts out there and those waiting customers looked forward to coming into the dealership to have their vehicle service and get a fresh cup of coffee and a donut. So it's those simple things that really make a difference for a customer experience. And we've got to remember to focus in on the minor details when it comes to our facilities down to the cleanliness of our bathrooms for our waiting customers. We, we want to make sure that we have the attention to detail necessary to warrant them to continue coming back to see us and that we take pride in our establishment. So next, we've got people. You know, with people, high-performing fixed ops teams continue to invest in their people. And so when it comes to people, you know, we have to embrace 
their values as a leader, but we also want to make sure that the people that we are employing believe and embrace in those same values, that they are able to deliver that experience to the customer that we want and that we've developed uh, as far as our culture. Because finding the right person to plug into your culture is very important. You know, you have to make sure, and I know it is very challenging to find great help, but you don't want to sacrifice your values of your organization, your dealership, your fixed ops department to just put someone in place. Make sure that there are cultural fit for everything that you've worked so hard to put in place. And then once you get them in place, you want to continue to help them grow. You know, employee retention is definitely a challenge, especially when it comes to service advisors. It's no secret, it's a tough job. But what we found through the course of working through this and in my experience working with dealers all over the country is it tends not to always be based on income. It doesn't always tie back to satisfaction equals pay. A lot of dealers have found great success in finding different ways to be able to keep their employees satisfied with balancing life at work and life outside of work. That's the hardest part about being a service advisor. Let's face it, we're open six to seven days a week, 7.30 to sometimes midnight if, if we've got a second or a third shift in some areas. And so when you look at that balance, being creative with the way that we can structure their schedules sometimes is enough to keep them happy without necessarily offering an increase in pay. When it comes to our technicians and their satisfaction, again, it, it's not always tied to pay. We're seeing more and more often now, it's tied to the ability to have a work-life balance and being able to offer them solutions that allow them to accomplish everything that they need to accomplish outside of work while being successful at work. And then last but not least, we have to make their environment fun. It's proven that if you enjoy coming to work, that you tend to work a lot better. You tend to have a higher level of efficiency and a higher customer satisfaction because the employees themselves are happy. I learned that as I traveled pre-COVID, many of those high-performing stop teams made work fun. They would have friendly competitions, not just spiff competitions, but they would have, you know, competitions around who could greet the most customers at the door or it was something as simple as that. All the way to, uh, there was a dealer that I visited in the Midwest where they did, you know, a, a food truck calendar. And so they would bring in various food trucks throughout the month to be able to offer their staff a simple solution to not necessarily have to leave and fight traffic to go get something to eat if they didn't want to pack their lunch. They, they brought in that food truck to improve the dealership experience, to, you know, just give them one less thing to have to figure out. You know, if we can help in those areas of the day-to-day -day lives of our employees and helping solve those small problems for them, they'll appreciate those small things. So I challenge you to think outside of the box because those high performing fixed ops teams right now, they are definitely retaining their staff and it is not always because they're paying them the highest rates available in the area. It's they value them as an individual and they're taking care of them and they're listening to them. Those are the things that we have to do in order for them to put forth their best efforts for us and for you as leaders. So, Next, we've got practice. We take those last four steps and we roll all of that together. We have to be able to put it into practice. So it's going to be very important to have the leaders, your service managers, your parts managers, your directors, all the way up to the GM. We should have those values laid out and shared with the team, and then they should be able to see them. You should be able to see them. We have to, uh, we say it often in performance management, you have to inspect what you expect, right? So 
Uh, the same goes true to finding a culture for your department. You have to look for it. When you see good, praise it. When you see an opportunity to coach, do it right then and there. You know, advise quickly on, hey, there was a better way for us to do this based off of the culture that we're trying to shift our departments into. Those high-functioning fixed ops departments have a strong culture in place of feedback early and often. They take the time to not only provide the feedback right there on the spot, but they're also taking the time to set aside the opportunity to have those one-on-one, -on -one, those development conversations, to, to be able to continue to push their staff to grow. So it is very important for all of the leaders, whether you're building your culture or maintaining your culture, to put it to practice for all to see. So now we'll talk through evolution. When we think about evolution, it's one of those situations where you're either going to the right or to the left. That's what I typically tell my viewers. You know, as a performance manager and engaging with clients, uh, the, the conversation around evolution comes up quite often because it simply is a situation where as a business, you can only stay stagnant, but for so long. And so eventually we're going to have to move from our current place. It's up to you to decide which direction that movement is going to go. And that's how I share it with dealers is, it's not going to wait for you. So either you're going to hop on and you're going to ride to improve and get bigger and better, or the opposite is going to happen. So hopefully we all want to continue to grow, get bigger and better, but it, we can't stay stagnant. We have to evolve. So with that, we have to take a look at our customer base first. The, the high performing fixed ops teams right now, while, we are focused on our customer of today. Our customer of today, as you can see here depicted in the chart, is generally going to, a bulk of that, over a quarter of our customers are going to be in that 50 to 65, 70 range. So when we think about their service experience, oftentimes we hear, well, we don't necessarily have to change anything because what we're doing is working. And it may be working right now because when you look at the fact that that current customer base is not used to seeing any other type of service provided. But in order to stay relevant, you have to be thinking about tomorrow's customer. So when we look at the chart here, those most successful fixed ops teams are not only looking at their customer of today, but they're looking at what is their customer going to want from them in five years, in 10 years, or even tomorrow. Because at the rate of change that we're going through, more and more customers are embracing the use of technology, which the Pew Research Center reiterates that. When we look at the chart here, well, yes, millennials and are embracing technology at a faster rate than the other generations out there. Those other generations still are embracing technology at a similar rate. So it's very important for us to look at our customer base and understand that as our customers evolve, we have to evolve our processes as well. And those highly functioning fixed ops departments do just that. They're taking the opportunity to work with customers today that have embraced technology, and they're preparing for the customer of tomorrow as well. When you look at the digital retail experience, and I know digital retailing is a buzzword right now because in all actuality, it's the way of the future. You know, I bought a handful of cars over the last few years, none of which I actually had to go to the dealership to purchase. I started the process online. I completed the process at my kitchen table. The vehicle was delivered to my driveway. My trade-in was taken from my driveway. So I look at the sales experience as the future of the service experience. And likewise, through working with those highly functioning fixed ops teams, that's the same approach that they take. If a bulk of their customer base, and a bulk of the customer base in general, is starting the buying experience online, and we're seeing an increase 
in every aspect of the purchase and buying experience increasing online, then eventually those same customers that are buying cars completely from their kitchen tables and their living rooms are going to need service. So where do we think they're going to start their search for their service experience? The same place they started is their buying experience. So as a dealer, you have to look at if we are offering our customers a complete digital retail experience, we can't forget about parts and service. The fixed ops experience is a part of a digital retailing experience because those same customers are going to want to have their vehicles serviced. And let's face it, at some point, they're going to need some type of repair as well. So we have to embrace the use of digital retailing in fixed ops to retain those customers. Because the old saying of, well, service sells the second, third, and fourth, in order for us to deliver on that, we have to deliver them the same experience that they experienced on the sales side. So with that being said, let's take a look at tech. Because we now understand our customers. Now let's understand our employees and how we can evolve with technology. So when we think about the, the early days of the service experience, we had paper ROs and paper MPI. And those were manual processes. And when those processes, when the, the paper MPI was rolled out, you've probably got some technicians in your shop that'll tell you they weren't fully embracing the idea or the concept of having to take the time to fill out the multi-point inspection form on the carbon copy. But then what happened? We went from paper ROs to electronic repair orders and electronic MPIs. Those same very technicians had the same frustration. The same advisors had the same frustration. We, we go through the same struggles as we evolve with technology. But those high-performing fixed ops teams have embraced the culture of continuous learning, and they are set up for success. So as they evolve with the tech, their staff is willing to embrace it because they're so used to changing and evolving and being at the cutting edge of providing their customers with what they are asking for. So most recently, now today, it's, it's video. You, we are rolling out video and we're offering that transparent experience. We're bringing the customer into the shop. So we're listening to what the customers are asking for and we're delivering it on it. But now we have that same struggle where we're moving from an electronic multi-point inspection, but we're adding to that. And now we're adding the short video from the technician explaining why the multi-point is the way that it is. Again, it's a constant evolution of improving and getting bigger and better. So when we think about embracing technology, you know, there's the tools that we need, you know, to, to deliver that, that customer experience aren't always going to be just buy it, launch it, and we're good to go. We have to remember that the customer is going to tell us what they want. So listen to your customers and embrace technology that's going to help you drive a stronger customer experience. Those highly functioning fixed ops departments, that is a habit that they have, is they embrace customer feedback. So when we're embracing that customer feedback and they're telling us how they want their service experience to be, we have to listen. And then we have to go out and seek to find the tools that will allow us to deliver upon their ask. Because again, I can't stress it enough, just because someone comes and says, hey, we've got a new shiny tool, doesn't necessarily mean it's the right tool for you. But if you listen to what the customers are asking for, and then finding your tool based off of what the customers ask is, that is going to allow you to save a ton of pain and headache in launching a product that you don't see any return on. So a perfect example of listening to your customer 
is going to be transportation methods. Oftentimes, in what you see here is, you know, a, a snapshot of an actual dealership in the Pacific Northwest that uh, has embraced the idea of utilizing alternate forms of transportation as a primary driver of helping them grow their dollar per RO tax. And as you can see on the chart here, there is a significant lift when offering those customers alternate transportation methods. When we look at waiters versus the loaner, being able to provide that loaner vehicle to the customer provides a significant lift. So in this situation, not only does this dealer offer valet, valet with loaner, as you can see, but it's the loaner in itself, meaning it may not always have to be all of those components, but in this particular dealership example, they saw a lift in every form of transportation outside of that customer waiting. Now, some may say, well, the waiting ROs are typically going to be quick return and burn. Well, yes, while that may be true, the opportunity to find that additional work with those express tickets is improved if I can get you from wanting to wait because of time and convenience to providing you with a vehicle where we can then take our time to look it over to assess what you truly need and find a solution for you typically is going to lead to a higher dollar for RO count. And those, that is a habit of our highly functioning fixed ops team is we're trying to take our express work and get it dropped off. Because let's face it, if a customer comes in unannounced with no appointment, the likelihood that we're gonna be able to turn that into a solid upsell is reduced because they haven't prioritized the additional time outside of simply what they walk through the door for. So by offering them those alternate transportation options when they do come through the door, it then gives us the ability to take our time but to also slow the customer down. Because now that customer isn't so focused on, I need to get out of here and get to the next errand on my list, I can still continue to run the errands on my list while you service my vehicle because you have provided me with another solution. And in doing so, I'm going to reward you by spending more money with your dealership. That's what we want to look for. This is a perfect example of a dealership that's listening to what their customers are asking for and they're being rewarded for it. Here's another example. This here is a chart that depicts our use of multimedia. So sending videos and pictures to the customer while we're servicing their vehicle. It really goes hand in hand with the ability to offer those alternate forms of transportation because if I don't have the customer necessarily in the dealership, in the waiting room, then I don't always have the ability to walk them back to their vehicle and show them. Show and tell is a feature that's been used since the beginning of time when it comes to servicing vehicles. We all can agree that when we're able to walk a customer back to the shop, show them their vehicle, show them why this particular repair needs to be completed, that we close that job at a higher rate than picking up the phone and just communicating what we've found. You can see here, the blue bar is going to be uh, a 30-day snapshot is what we're looking at here. But the blue bar is going to be uh, no media. So we haven't sent the customer anything to support what we found wrong with their vehicle. And that red dot is going to be our conversion rate. So we're co converting at about 26% when we have no media sent to the customer. The green bar is going to be if you just add a photograph. So simply by adding a photograph to our recommendation, we're able to increase our conversion rate from 26% to 32% by adding simply a still image. And then when we look at the gold bar, that's gonna be video by itself. So some might say, well, hey, it's, it's lower in dollar revenue that's being generated, but we have to look at our conversion rate. Video alone is converting at 44%. And so as one of my PMs says often, a little plus a little equals a lot. So at 44%, when we provide that video, now we're driving an experience. We've now brought the shop to the customer and they've rewarded us by approving more work. 
when we see in the orange bar a combination of photos and videos, which would be the most ideal means of utilizing enhanced multimedia, we're closing at 39%, and that dollar value skyrocket. So the proof is in the pudding. When we provide the customers with transparency and an experience, they reward us by spending more money. So oftentimes, one of the biggest struggles when deploying new software and continuing to evolve with software is the learning curve required with that new launch. And I tell every service advisor, service manager, or anyone that I come into interaction with that has this very frustration, and that is we have to slow down to move faster. Yes, it may take an extra two to three minutes for the technician to capture the media. Yes, it may take an extra two to three minutes for the advisor to review and put together their quote microsite with the videos and the photos and the presentation laid out properly. But where we save time is in the approval process. As an advisor, if we use the traditional means of picking up the phone and calling the customer, well, in the day and age of spam calls and everything else that goes along, yes, we may be on the lookout for that call with an update for our vehicle, but we may be in a meeting. We may be tied up with something and you have to leave a voicemail. Well, now what happens, we leave that voicemail, the technician's got a vehicle apart, they're now gonna have to figure out, do I put it back together? and lose time putting it back together to then have to take it apart to repair it? Or do I leave it here and then lose out on my ability to continue working on another vehicle that's waiting? Well, right now, more than ever, our shops are full. So we need to be able to have our efficiency rates at the highest rate possible. Well, doing the extra work to provide that quote to the customer, if I then send it via text, many of you have gotten a text message through the course of watching this presentation. You've probably looked at it even answered a few. So the same could be had with our customer base. Our customers have acknowledged that they would prefer to text more than they would a phone call. So using the quote microsite, because we've provided them with the transportation method, and then we incorporate the use of bringing them into shop because we've now photographed and provided a video from the technician explaining why the repairs that he's recommended are needed we quickly get a response from the customer. That's reducing the downtime and waiting for that approval. So the time that we lost to prepare the presentation is made up in our ability to get the approval back to the technician. In most cases, without them having to pull that vehicle out of their bay to pull it back in. That time saved, saved allows the technician to then work on an additional one to two cars on average with the dealers that I'm working with that have implemented the use of multimedia, they've been able to put more cars through the shop more efficiently and reduce their day's weight simply by cutting out the back and forth. So that's just a quick example of the power of using tech and embracing the use of technology and then reinforcing the use of that tech through a performance manager that helps you drive utilization. Our performance managers are here to do just that, to work with you, to get your staff up to speed and get the most out of the tools that the customers have asked for. Once we've instilled those behaviors, they become a habit that makes them super efficient and the customers look for that experience every time they come in. It's a driving force to your retention numbers to provide that level of transparency and consistency. So it, it's no secret. We, you all as dealers understand why customers go elsewhere. It's trust, convenience, and value. And so we know that those are the top three reasons that our customers deflect and go to independence and other places to service their vehicles. We have to continue our efforts in being able to retain those customers at our facility. And as we embark on this journey into a more digital retailing experience, 
it's more important than ever before for us not to lose sight of those three key areas. So when we think about trust, again, multimedia, the ability to bring the customer into the shop without having them physically walk back there and take away from what the technician has going on is a driving force in trust. Transparent pricing. From the start of the experience, again, going back to if I can buy a car online, I see the price of that car, transact and have that vehicle in my driveway within a matter of days, there is no reason why I shouldn't be able to know the cost of a simple oil change for that very car without having to come physically into the dealership or pick up the phone and call to ask, how much a simple oil change would be on that vehicle. Transparent pricing today is more important than ever before in our digital retailing landscape. And then online approvals. There's no need to have a conversation with a customer about what was approved and what was not approved when we have the ability to give them the full power. Our highly functioning fixed ops teams have embraced this concept because it offers a tremendous amount of trust and transparency for both parties because we have provided it to the customer and they have the power to then decide what they want to do. Next up, we've got convenience. Convenience continues to be a struggle and it will continue to be a struggle because we live in a go, go, go society. So our most successful dealers are embracing the use of pickup and delivery when possible. We are offering the ability to come pick your vehicle up from your office, from your house, and deliver it back to you wherever you may be. That convenience simplifies our customers' need to take away time to be able to service their vehicles, which is a challenge for everyone. But we can't forget about mobile service. So mobile service was a hot button as we moved through COVID. The ability to get text out to wherever that vehicle may be and service it on site. That is an area that is going to continue to grow. And our dealers that have embraced that concept of using mobile service can all speak to the satisfaction of most of their customers and being able to do everything without having to physically come to the dealership. Now, in some, some, in some situations, yes, we, we do have to bring that vehicle into this, the repair facility, but things like software updates or, you know, simple oil changes, those, those minor services that can be completed in someone's driveway, um, that is an area for you to grow your business because we are headed that direction. Again, I go back to if I can buy a car and have it delivered to my driveway, I should be able to schedule service and have a, a reflash completed in my driveway as well without having to come to the dealership. And then last but not least, when it comes to convenience, expanding our loaner fleet. So expanding the loaner fleet, is it's no surprise. It's a win-win for everyone involved when possible because we're able to have our customers put into another vehicle while we're servicing them their vehicle, which gives us the opportunity to do a few things. When they're in that newer vehicle, as we're servicing theirs, they may want to buy that vehicle. So then we're able to get them the sales and then they purchase, you know, a similar vehicle or even that vehicle. But expanding our loaner fleets and service gives us a great opportunity to increase our dollars for RO, as depicted in the graph that I showed from the dealer in the Pacific Northwest. It also is going to give us the ability to drive more used car inventory as we turn those learner vehicles over time. So increasing and expanding your learner program is probably the most beneficial for every department within your dealership while providing the customers with a world-class experience because they're not stuck waiting in the waiting room for a service that they're then rushing you for. And then last but not least, it's value. And, and value is probably one of my favorite 
items to really unpack with dealers because uh, a lot of value comes in the form of perception, right? So when we think about value, the dealers that we've surveyed at Exxon all agree, 91% of them, that the experience is more important than the physical repair of the vehicle. So we acknowledge that, but we aren't always delivering on that. So the dealers that I've had the pleasure of working with have made it their primary focus to deliver value. And, you know, I had one dealer, uh, the service manager, he explained it to me uh, like steaks. He said, Gerald, he said, I can go to Outback and get a steak. It's still going to be a good steak. But if I want to have an experience, I go to Ruth Chris. And it makes sense. At the end of the day, steak is a steak. But what you're paying for is the experience. So it is very important for us to look at our experience and ask ourselves with, you know, the rates that we're charging, because let's face it, we, we want to separate ourselves from the independents uh, because we're, we're the dealership. We are, you know, at the highest level of expertise in servicing these vehicles do we deliver that same experience to the customer? And we can definitely deliver on that by giving them the ability to utilize technology the way that they want it. We have to continue listening to our customers and they will reward us with their business. So as we sum things up, there are key there are a few key things that I want you to take away from it is today. So that's going to be define your vision. If you have one, great. Revisit it. Make sure that everyone on your team knows it, that you see it in action every day. Then don't sacrifice your culture. Don't plug in just the body because we need to hire. Make sure that they fit the mold of what you all are trying to achieve in your department. If they're moldable and teachable, then absolutely take them on. But don't allow one person to ruin the culture of your department because it is possible. Next, I want you to make sure that you listen to your customers, but not only listen, but listen and take action. Show the customers that we are willing to adapt and evolve to provide you with the experience that you were looking for so you don't have to go anywhere else. Invest in technology. But again, as I said earlier, don't just invest in tech to invest in it. Invest in the technology that is going to be impactful to your customer experience. And then you have to ensure that when you invest in that technology, that you continue to train your staff because simply buying the tech is not going to solve the problem. The tech is a tool that's utilized by your staff to be able to allow them to get the best possible return out of your customers. So with that in mind, I'd like to say thank you for joining me today. If you should have any questions, my email address is here on the screen. I'd love the opportunity to connect with you. Thank you and take care.